Okay. All right. All right. So let's see. Um, I'll put up that. Uh, you got that first inter sheet. The introductory hand sheet there. Right. Okay. Let me put that up. And you should have. Okay. It. All right. So here's a here's a sheet with a couple of hands to to kind of get us started. Um. Let's take a look at hand A real quick. This is a this is a kind of sets the stage for everything we're going to be talking about. So your dealer, you're not vulnerable. The opponents are vulnerable. So it's favorable to you, and you have the following hand. And that's a singleton spade, double and jack of hearts, four diamonds to the queen ten, six clubs, queen jack nine. What, if anything, do you do you bid with this hand? Anybody have any commentary on that? Clubs. Okay, three clubs. Is that you, Jerry? Oh, that was Harry. That was Harry. That was Harry. Okay, Harry. Harry said three clubs. Okay, and that's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if and so the main thing I would say about this, you know, it looks awfully weak. You only have a six card suit. Uh, all these things that were kind of contrary to what we were taught when we first learned how to play this game. But this is a standard three club bid uh, in this day and age. Especially and, at that vulnerability. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And if you, even if, even if you are not doing this to your opponents, opening three clubs with hands like this, they're doing it to you. And you got to be ready for it. And this is the world we're living in as far as dealing with preamps in modern bridge. You know, you used to have things like, oh, well, you need to have two of the top three honors and you, you had to have a seven card suit and all these uh, hyper disciplined things. Uh, and that's just not the way the game is played anymore, especially at the expert level. Now, one reason that makes one hand, thing that makes this hand especially attractive for a preempt is it's got 10 cards in the minor suits. So you've got six points and you have 10 cards in the minor suits. The odds are the opponents have the points and the odds are that the opponents have the major suits. Yeah. So we're not going to let them start with their, you know, one hard opening or whatever it is and bid comfortably to some contract. We're going to make them work and open three clubs. Now, if, like I said, if you're doing that, then your good opponents are doing it to you and you got to be able to handle it. All right, now let's look at hand B, kind of setting the stage. Okay, you've got both sides vulnerable and your right-hand opponent opens three clubs. Now, I'm not asking for people to answer this question yet. Okay, we're gonna come back to this, but the question is, with which of the two hands below would you make a takeout double of three clubs? Either number one, number two, neither of them, or both of them. And hopefully after we've gone through the information that uh, I've put together, uh, the answer to this question will be very clear. Okay, James, let's go ahead and put up the, the paper itself. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna check something real quick. Oh, I'm so full. Okay. All right, so as we said, uh, in, in the bridge world today, people are coming at us with preamps uh, right and left, especially the strong players who seem even more aggressive about throwing in the, the preemptive bids. And there are reasons why they do it. And first is the one I alluded to, it makes, us, makes it harder for us to bid because in, we have to start at a high level. And that makes our bid, bids, by definition, broader, less well-defined. Uh, we don't have our comfortable system of one bids and responses. And we a lot of times we have to guess. And if the opponents can make you guess, then they're part way down the road to getting a good score. And there's another reason why strong players preempt a lot. 
And that's, they don't think you can handle it. That's just the reality of the situation. So today we're gonna try to see what we can do to change that so that you can fight back and do a good job against preamps. So here, here, what we're gonna go through are some concepts and principles that hopefully will help you do that. And I phrased them in, in, as rules. They're really not rules exactly. They're more just uh, guiding principles to keep in mind to help you make the right decision when you're uh, confronted with a tough situation at the table. All right, rule number one, don't expect perfection. Um, when they start at an opening bid is three hearts. Um, you're not going to get it right every time in deciding what to do. And as a partnership, you're not going to get to the best contract every time. That's why they're preempting. So relax and do the best you can. The thing to do is to have your principles and your concepts that you know and then apply them in a disciplined manner, in a partnership manner. And that's gonna get you through better than anything else. I refer to that in the paper as staying in the boat. Stay in the boat. Don't go off on, your, on a tangent by yourself. Stay within what your partner has the right to expect from you. And that way you can work as a team. Now at the bottom of the page is a very important concept. Okay, your opponents are preempting. It's a match point game. Okay, all you have to do is handle the preempts better than the other pairs. You don't have to be perfect and you don't have to get everything exactly right. You just need to do better than most of the other pairs. So don't panic. Use your uh, principles, the concepts that you know come up with a plan that has the best percentage chance to succeed and you're gonna be okay more times than not. All right, down to page two. All right, so rule number two is know what your bids mean. That seems elementary, but I promise you when I'm playing against people on BBO, uh, you know, a lot of times people are really struggling. Well, you know, what does that double mean? What does a new suit mean? Uh, uh, over a preempt, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, a preempt is made, partner over calls, and then the responder bids a new suit. Is that forcing uh, uh, all, all these issues? Okay. If you don't know what your bids mean, you can't win. So this is a, a time for discussion with your partner. And one thing you probably have heard, and this is definitely true, is that you can't preempt over a preempt. So if they open two hearts and your partner jumps to three spades, that's not a preempt. That is a two spade bid, but more so. Extra spades, extra strength, you know, too, too strong for that, for, for a two spade bid. Um, now, I don't wanna go spend a lot of time on, what, on, on methods here. Uh, that's something that you and your partner should talk about, but I did provide in the back of the paper an appendix that gives you uh, at least a checklist of things to look at and discuss with your partner. And hopefully when you've done that, then you're both going to be on more solid ground. Okay, rule number three, avoid guessing as much as you can. You don't want to guess unless you have to. Now, there are situations where you're just stuck and you, you got to make the decision and you got to make the best guess you can. But those are those are to be avoided if you can do it. Now, the example I give there, if you look at the bottom of the page, it's it's uh, the hand with three spades to the jack, ace and one heart, jack third of clubs and king, queen, jack fifth. Uh, jack there are diamonds king queen jack fifth of clubs and your right hand opponent opens two spades all right now what you have here is a, a minimum opening hand you got some decent clubs and here you are vulnerable for goodness sake do not just guess to bid three clubs 
you know, don't go with how you're feeling at the moment, et cetera, and bid three clubs. This hand isn't good enough for a three club bid. It's barely good enough to open, much less to come in vulnerable at the three level. So don't guess, let it come around to your partner and maybe your partner can help. Now, as, as we're gonna discover in the next rule, there may be, there's a feature about your hand that makes you very optimistic what? the partner will be able to help you. And that feature is the fact that you have three clubs to the jack. I mean, three, excuse me, three spades to the jack. Because your right-hand opponent presumably has six spades. You have three spades. There's a good chance that your partner is short in spades. And if she is, there's a good chance that she's going to be able to act. And we're going to get into that uh, right now in rule number four. Okay, James, if you bump it up another page. Okay, now rule number four is the rule. If there's nothing else you take away from this talk, please remember this rule or please remember this concept. The player who strains to bid is the one who is short in the opponent's suit. Okay, I can't overemphasize this. The player who strains to bid is the one who is short in the opponent's suit. So what, what do I mean by that? In other words, if you're not sure whether to bid, the tiebreaker, the factor that will uh, shape your decision one way or the other is very likely to be, am I short in the opponent's suit? If I'm short in the opponent's suit, I can strain to bid. If I'm not short in the opponent's suit, then I don't strain to bid. And it's as simple as that. Now, let's look, thinking back at the hand we just discussed where I said, for goodness sake, do not overcall three clubs. You've got Jack third of spades. Partner, very likely, is short in spades. And if she is, she is the one who will strain to bid, not you. So you don't strain to bid with a hand like that with length in the, in, in the opponent's suit because you think there is a very likely possibility that if the hand belongs to us, partner will be short and partner will strain to act. Okay. Now there's another example in the middle of the page. If you can see it there, that has six hearts to the king, 10, nine. Okay, so you're vulnerable and your opponents are not vulnerable. And the person to your left says two spades, pass, pass around to you and you're looking at this hand. Okay, now from a just a classical sense, I mean, bidding three hearts vulnerable, you've got a, kind of a moth-eaten suit, you only have 11 points, et cetera, et cetera. But you are the person who is short in the opponent's suit. There is every reason to think that partner has, A, has a few spades, which prevented her from bidding, and B, has a few high card points, because you only have 11 and there's a week two to your left. All right, and you're short in spades. That makes you think that partner may have been stuck for a bid over two spades and be very happy to hear you bid. So you bid three hearts with this hand. You strain to bid because you're the one who is short in the opponent's suit. Okay, now the flip side of the rule is the player with length in the opponent's suit does not strain to bid. So the hand we just discussed with the five clubs to the king, queen, jack, that's what applies there. You're not going to strain to bid with a hand like that. You're going to pass and, and let it, you know, let it come around to partner. If partner has a reasonable hand, the odds are that she is short in spades and she will strain to bid. So it's a teamwork thing, kind of a yin and yang thing that works incredibly well. 
Okay, so we've talked about some hands here. Uh, there's an example hand at the top of page four uh, where, you know, if it comes around to partner, there, there's her hand and she's got nine, uh, she's got a 12 count. Okay, and she's gonna double back in because she's the one who's short in the opponent's suit. Okay, so you might look at all this and you say, well, wait a minute now, it's too risky. Here I am going to the three level on these hands. And what I want you to understand, this is particularly true at match points, but it's true at imps too, because you can get stolen blind five imps at a time in part score swings. But risk comes in many forms. Of course, one risk is you stick your neck out, somebody chops it off and you go for a number. 800, 1100, 1400. Uh, I had a hand the other day. My partner opened two diamonds and in comes the person on a nothing hand with three clubs because they thought, well, it's a week two, I can come in. And I'm sitting here with 17 points and ace, queen, jack, fourth of clubs. And, and I, I doubled and they went for 1700. So yeah, okay, it's risky to come in. And every once in a while, you'll get caught speeding and, and, and they'll get you. But the, there's another risk. And I would tell you, it's a more frequent risk and it accounts for a lot more zeros than going for a number on a double. And that is, you sit there, you, you say it's too risky to bid and you don't come in and the opponents buy the hand cheaply and steal from you. And you could have made three hearts, but they bought it for two spades and went plus 110. And, uh, you know, or even if they meant minus 50, you were entitled to 140, maybe 170, maybe even a game. And that's a, that is a zero. When that happens, you get zero on the scorecard and a match point game. And it doesn't feel like that. Oh, well, you know, it's just 110. It wasn't 800 or anything, but it's a zero just the same. So what I really want you to understand is that risk is all risks are relative. The risk of getting stolen from on a part score hand is very, very frequent. And if you fail 10 times that way, but you succeed once in avoiding a telephone number, your, your, your net is you've got 10 poor scores and one good score. I'd rather take the risk and go the other way. Okay, now while, I've, while I'm here, let me make clear about something. I am not saying, well, we have to bid because we can't let them play two spades. I can't tell you how many I've heard, many times I've heard players say that, well, we can't let them play two spades. Well, Yes and no, it depends on the situation. But there are many times when it's better to just take your plus 50 in two spades because it's a misfit hand and you can't make anything. So I'm, what I'm saying is don't be scared and don't back off of bidding when you know you should just because uh, you're worried about the, the risk involved. There's a risk anytime you bid or fit or choose not to bid. Okay, let's look at example one there at the bottom of the page. All right, this is a hand where you can see there you've got jack fourth of spades, ace third of hearts, five strong diamonds and single and club. And the dealer opens three clubs to your right, neither vulnerable. Okay, now to me, this hand, it's crystal clear to act with this hand. And it is marginal in terms of high card points. You are straining to bid, but you're going to strain to bid because you're the one who's short in their suit. Now, it, there are some people that I, I, I've seen people who would want to bid three diamonds with this hand, but I think the better bid is to double because this game is about majors and no trump, it's not about diamonds. So when you can support both majors nicely and you're really comfortable with whatever suit partner wants to name, it's better to double. 
Okay. Um, now let's look at example two real quick at the top of the next page. All right, this is a hand where you're holding, you're holding um, four spades to the king and ace third of hearts, jack nine third of diamonds and ace nine eight of clubs. You're vulnerable and you're, and the opponents are not vulnerable. Okay, so you've got barely an opening hand, but the bidding has gone three clubs to your left, pass, pass, and here you are. Well, and part of you might say, well, I'm in the pass out seat. Um, I've got an opening hand, barely, uh, should I bid? Well, if you bid, you know that you are straining to bid. You are going out of your way to the bid to bid because you know your hand on the merits is not good enough for, for a bid over three clubs. So how do you decide? And I submit to you the way to decide is to look at your clubs. You have three clubs in your hand. That means partner is likely to be short in clubs. Yet partner, who is going to strain to bid with short clubs, didn't say a word over three clubs. So either partner has short, shortish clubs with a poor hand, or partner isn't short in clubs at all. Your other opponent is short in clubs and is itching to have you play this hand with a, a lead for, for the singleton and to defend and set you. Now, I mean, it's not gonna work every time, but the percentage move is to pass. Now, again, why is that so? Because you've got length in the opponent's clubs. The length in the opponent's clubs is basically a danger signal. Whereas shortness in the opponent's clubs is an invitation to bid. And if you take, again, if you take nothing more from this talk than that simple concept, you'll be well ahead of the game. We're going to talk about some examples in a minute, and you'll see this in action. Okay, rule number five. It's not about high card points. Okay, in all the talk that we've had uh, since we started uh, today, you haven't heard me once say anything about in anything specific about how many high card points you need, what do you have to do, et cetera. And that's because the, the decision whether to bid is not primarily about high card points. It's about shape and it's about the logic of the situation you're com confronted with. All right, let's look at this example, uh, example three. Okay. Now here, you've got an, uh, four, four in the majors and ace, king, 10, nine, fifth of diamonds, void and clubs. The dealer to your left opens three clubs and this comes around to you. Now I guarantee you there's some people looking at this and I bet you I looked at it this way many years ago. I, I, you could say, I don't have anything to think about here. I'm in the pass out seat. I only have eight points. I can't be bidding vulnerable or, you know, at the three level with only eight points. But think again. The dealer opened, you only have a uh, preempt and you only have eight points. Partner is marked with some cards. And also partner is probably marked with some clubs, which kept her from bidding. You've got great support for all the suits. You've got an ace king if you have to defend. And the critical thing is you are the one who is short in the opponent's suit. So again, it's not gonna work every time but the percentage move here is to double, even though all you, all you have is eight points. Partner knows you're in the pass out seat. 
Partner knows you're straining to bid. Partner will cut you some slack. You have a wonderful playing hand. Partner has a suit to go with her three or four clubs that she probably has. If she's got a suit, you've got a wonderful playing hand and plenty of roughing potential. So the, the hand is going to play nicely if you can find a fit. But, hey, it's up to you. You're in the pass out seat. If it's not you, it's nobody. You've got to act. Again, it's not about how many high card points you have. Let's look at example two. Here's a hand where you've got uh, 12 points. Oh, wait a minute. I'm looking, no, I'm looking at the wrong hand. Excuse me, example four. My bad. Okay. Now this is a hand that actually happened at the table about three weeks ago. And again, you've only got eight high card points. You've got four spades, four good spades to the king, queen, and six hearts, queen, jack, nine, eight. And you're vulnerable. And it goes three clubs to your left, pass, pass. Now, again, some people would look at this and say, well, man, I'd like to bid, but I've only got eight points. How can I be bidding vulnerable at the three level with only eight points? And the response to that is, yeah, but you've got the singleton club. You're the one who's short in their suit. And you're six, four, you have, you know, what's the cliche, six, four, bid some more. You've got a good suit to bid. And partner will understand that you're in the pass out seat and acting because you're short in clubs. Now, this is a perfect example of what I was saying earlier. Is it risky to bid three hearts? Of course it is. There's some risk in there. But, I, but if I passed three clubs with this hand, I would be petrified that I was getting a terrible result because it's so likely that we have a home in hearts or spades. So again, it's not about high card points. It's about the shape and the logic of the situation. Okay, rule number six, count on your partner. That means if you're supposed to, if the, if the, lot, if the rules and principles that you guys have agreed on call for you to pass and allow partner to take up the slack, then you've got to have confidence that partner will do that. And you can't be saying, oh, I've, you know, I've got to act because I'm afraid partner won't do this or that. This is, this is where partnership understandings and partnership bidding come into play. Now look, at, look, look at example five. Now this is a hand uh, that, that came up in actual play. And the person, you have 15 points. And your right-hand opponent opens three hearts. What in the world are you going to do with that? I mean, you've got 15 points. You know, are, what are you going to do? Well, you've got two stoppers and you got 15 points. And I know some players who would bid three no Trump with this hand. And, you know, sometimes they'll strike gold and sometimes they won't. It's just the luck of the draw. But there are two big warning flags here. One is that you have the length in the opponent's suit. And you don't really have a source of tricks. How, what are you going to use to put together to make nine tricks unless partner has a good hand? But partner is a past hand. Now, let's think about that for a minute. You're long in hearts. How many hearts does partner have? Probably very few, one or two. Maybe, maybe none. And partner is a past hand. What if you pass th let three hearts come around to your partner? Partner is sitting there as a past hand, and now it's like she's been, you know, freed from bondage. 
She doesn't have to worry about, does she have an opening hand or any of this kind of stuff? She, she, she knows that you're not expecting her to have an opening hand. So if she has the correct shape, she will act. So if she has the nine or 10 points you need to make three no Trump, and if she's short in hearts, which she knows she is, then she will act. If she doesn't have what you need, she won't act. So you're going to get to the right place either way based on what partner does. It's much more effective to let pass it around to partner and learn what she's got rather than you just taking it on your own self and bidding a, a, a blind 3 no Trump. Because again, for you to make 3 no Trump, you need her to have nine or 10 points. But if it comes around and she has nine or 10 points with short hearts, she's going to bid for you. And now you'll know what to do. And maybe if she doubles, maybe you're going to pass three hearts double for a very nice penalty. But, if, but the important thing is if she passes, then you know she doesn't have the hand you're hoping for. And so now it's perfectly fine to just defend against three hearts and beat it a trick or two and move on the road because you aren't making three no Trump with this hand if partner can't act. Okay, and, and, and that hand right there is, a, a, that kind of hand comes up all the time and that's a solution that's reliable. You're gonna get it right 90% of the time that way. And that's a lot better than just guessing to bid three no Trump or just, you know, guessing to bid whatever. Okay, now rule number seven, read the situation. So a lot of times, if you just stop and think a second, there'll be some factors that, in the situation that will lead you to the right result because they'll point, they'll point to some information that's not there on the surface, but it's there a little deeper if you look. Okay. Let's look at uh, hand number seven. All right, now hand number seven, all right, is a preemptive hand where you've opened one diamond with the hand at the top of the page. You've opened one diamond, it goes three clubs to your left, pass, pass. And you have to decide what to do. Wait a minute, I got that. Yeah, okay. All right, so you have to decide what to do. Either you're gonna reopen with a double or you're not. Now, on one level, you're dead minimum for this opening bid. So you could just say, look, I'm minimum, my partner didn't say anything, I'm out. Okay, on the other hand, you've got perfect shape. So what do you do? Well, let's look at it a little deeper. What if I told you that when you opened one diamond, it was in second chair and the person to your right passed and then you opened one diamond and then it went the third chair person bid three clubs. Okay, now if you're, if you're watching your opponents one thing you'll notice is that when, when they're in third chair, they're much more likely to preempt. When their partner's a past hand, they're much more likely to preempt because they know they're not preempting their partner anymore. And they know the hand doesn't belong to them. And so they're, they're gumming up the works on your bidding. So in this example, if it went past then to your right, you know that the person to your right is not sitting there with a big hand. You opened a diamond and this person preempt, preempted. Okay, the odds are quite good that partner is sitting over there with some cards. And with your void in the clubs, there's a pretty good chance partner is sitting there with some clubs. But if he's not, then maybe he's got a four card major, maybe he's got some diamonds for you, whatever. You, you can play anywhere. 
Now, this hand came up in actual play with my partner, Lewis Sacker, and me. And Lewis was the person who had this hand. And you can see what my hand was. It's in the middle of the page. I had ace, queen, 10, fifth of clubs. And Lewis risked it and said double, and it was all passed, and 500 was the result in three clubs double. And the person who preempted, it wasn't like they preempted on a horrible hand. They had a seven card suit, but the cards were stacked and the penalty was severe. But that's because Lewis read the situation and realized he was in good shape and, and it was safe for him to double back in. Okay, now example eight is, is uh, similar. Okay, your side is vulnerable, they aren't. Dealer to your right passes, you pass. So you're a path, now you're a passed hand. It goes two diamonds, pass, pass. Okay, now you could say, well, what am I thinking about? I only have nine points. But think about the auction, read the situation, okay? The person to your right didn't open. You only have nine points. The person to your left is preempting. Doesn't that mean partner has some, has some cards? Why isn't partner bidding? Well, you have a clue in your hand. You only have two diamonds. There's a good chance that partner's got some diamonds or that partner has enough diamonds that her hand was awkward and she couldn't come in uh, honestly over two diamonds. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm playing against people, when it goes pass, pass, I hear a lot of two diamonds and two hearts and two spades and three clubs and three diamonds on junk, okay? Because they're not vulnerable and they're trying to gum up the works. And this two diamond bid could be very, very thin in this situation. The other thing I want you to understand is because you're a past hand, you're protected. It helps you because partner knows that you're not, if you double back in on this hand, partner knows that you are not doing it with an opening hand or a particularly good hand. You're doing it with something in terms of high cards and shortness in their suit. So partner knows what to expect from your hand and will make the right decision a high percentage of the time. That's important. If you're a past hand and you're thinking about balancing after a preempt comes around to you, you're protected by the fact that you are a past hand. Okay, rule number eight. When I play against people, and particularly on bridge base. Now, now I've played on bridge base for years and years, but but you're, we're seeing more and more players on bridge, bridge base. One thing I notice is the propensity for people to make uh, off shape takeout doubles. And so rule number eight is be careful about making off shape takeout doubles. Now I didn't say don't do it because that's not realistic to, to have a blanket rule like that. It's that'd be too limiting. I'm saying be careful. And what I mean by careful is you have a good reason for the double. And you have a plan for what you're gonna do when partner inevitably bids your short suit. Because a corollary of Murphy's law is that when you double with a singleton or a doubleton, in an unbid suit, partner will bid that suit 99 times out of 100. So you have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, don't do it. Okay, now I, I'm not gonna belabor this one uh, and take up time with it, but if you read the notes, I think it lays it out for you uh, the, the, the reasoning behind this. But again, so the way you do it is you say, okay, I'm tempted to double here. 
but I don't have what partner is expecting. So what am I going to do if partner bids the uncomfortable thing? And if there's no good answer, then you can't double. It's as simple as that. You may be able to do something else, but you can't double. Okay. Number nine is a good rule to remember over preamps. And it, it's also really a good rule for when you're even thinking about it, making a simple overcall of a one level opening. And that is be careful about bidding with the death holding. Okay. What do I mean by the death holding? The person to your right preempts in a suit and you have a something like jack third, 10 third, three small. It's the death holding because the person, if you bid now and you buy the contract, the person to your left is going to lead his partner's preempt suit. And if your partner has something like queen third, king third, three small, okay, now you're in big trouble because they're off to a quick start defending you and you're maybe going for your life. So if you've got a hand that has the death holding in their suit, be careful. And that can be the tiebreaker to say, no, I'm going to, discretion is the better part of valor on this hand. I barely have a hand that's worth, that might be worth bidding. And I have a terrible holding in their suit. Now let's think about that for a minute. They opened, they opened, let's say three diamonds and you have three diamonds to the jack and a 13 count. Okay, you're not going to double with that hand. Even if you have support for all the suits, you'll only have 13 points and you have a horrible holding in diamonds. But let's think. There's six or seven diamonds to my right. I have three. The odds are good that partner is short in diamonds. And if partner, when it comes around to partner, if she is short in diamonds, and has a few values, as we've seen earlier, she's going to do something and that will bail you out. So rather than you sticking your neck on the guillotine with Jack third of diamonds and a marginal hand, why not pass it around to partner and let partner make a, a, a choice? If partner doesn't have what we need, she's going to pass and we're going to be perfectly happy letting them play three diamonds. But if she has some values and shortness in diamonds, we're going to hear from partner. And now it becomes a cooperative effort rather than just one person making the decision. By the way, in the footnote at the bottom of the page, it, it, it tells you that this is a, you can look at this similarly when you're thinking about overcalling. Because if you have a marginal overcall, say a marginal too hard overcall after one spade opponent opens one spade you're you, you're thinking about bidding two hearts but it's kind of eh, you know nothing special and then you take another look and you say wait a minute i've got three spades to the jack Ugh. because now what's the op i bid two hearts and it goes all pass or i bid two hearts and it goes pass pass double all pass all right what do you think the left-hand opponent is going to leave a spade and you've got nothing in spades and partner may have something, you know, King third. Wow. That's worthless. And now they, you know, they start off with two spades and a spade rough before you even get started. So be careful with that death holding. Okay. So let's go back. Um, Let's go back to the introductory hands, James. And um, let's look back here at hand B. Okay, so now let's look at, let's decide which, if any of these hands, we would make a takeout double. Uh, 
All right. Who thinks, does anybody think that uh, we should make a takeout double of hand number with, with hand number, hand number one, it goes three clubs with both vulnerable and it's your bid with this 14 count. Would you double? Nope. Okay. Jerry, why not? Well, you're long in their suit. Yeah. You're long in your suit, marginal hand, right? vulnerable at the three level. And look, they, they opened three clubs. They got six, maybe seven. You've got four. Partner is short in clubs in all likelihood. And if she's not, you, you don't want to be in this auction either. But you hope that she will double back in. <laughs> That's right. And if she does... Now you're in business. You can decide to play for penalties. You can bid your hearts. You can do whatever you want. Okay. But if you double, now all of a sudden you're in the auction. You've promised points. Ah, you kind of barely have it. You don't have diamond support. This again is perfect one off shape. Perfect example of not doubling off shape. If I double with this hand, my partner will bid three diamonds in a New York minute. And now what do I do? So, yeah, so you're not gonna do it with hand number one. Now, how about hand number two? What's the thing, anybody have a thought about that one? I'd say you do. I'd say you double. I do too. Yep, you double with hand number two and you say, so on one level, you say, well, gosh, I only have 11 points. But it's a really good 11 points. Look at the texture in the suits. And most importantly, and you've got majors. And most importantly, you're the one who's short in clubs. If you pass and you say, oh, I can't bid. I only have 11 points, partner. It's going to come around to your partner. And now here's your partner with, let's say, a four-card heart suit and a 10 count. And, and and three or four clubs. What in the world is she supposed to do over three clubs? She can't bid. And now you've let them steal it in three clubs when you were cold for three or four hearts or spades. So you you double with this hand. And and there it is. So the answer on the on, on hand B is you double with number two and you pass with number one. Okay. James, I'm going to make one quick check and see if I've got something to send you. Hang on. Okay, for some, for some reason, the hands I wanted to scan you have not gone through, and I can't fix it <laughs> in this short a time. So um, what I want to do is look at some example hands and... Um, I'm going to have to figure out a way to communicate what the hand is. And the, game really... is start, the game is scheduled to start right now. Oh, what time is it? It's 1 125. 125. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I've got these five hands. I'm going to send them to Beth to include with the notes. And that'll be at the end of the notes that you'll that you have that will have access to. And I, there are five example problems with a solution at the bottom and a pretty uh, thorough explanation of wh what the answer is. So I, what I'd like you to do is after you've studied the material, take a look at those five hands and see if you can get those right. Because if you got them right, then you got them. If you don't, then take another look and if you got a question, you're welcome to send me an email, whatever you need to do. Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, compare notes with you or go through it. But these are the hands, just in closing, these are the hands that in a tough Swiss team event, these are the hands that are going to win you the event. In a tough match point event, these are the hands that are going to win you the event. When the opponents put a roadblock preempt on you and now you got to deal with it if you can handle it you can win if you're guessing you're going to get beat 
And it's as simple as that. Okay. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. Really good, Steve. Thank you, Thank you Steve. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Hey, everybody by the way, everybody, sign in. Everybody, sign in for the game. This is part one. Part two. That's is right. Yes. Yeah, that's there's right. There's more. Wait, there's more. There will be more. <laughs> At a future date, part two At is future. coming. That's okay. right. Thank you very much. That was very. Okay.